सदानंदरूपम अद्वैतम सदानंदरूपम अद्वैतम सत्यम शिवम सुंदरम सदानंदरूपम शिवोहम शिवोहम सो वेलकम सुजी टू एडवाइजर बाकी एंड सेवा थैंक यू इट्स अ प्लेजर बीइंग हियर वंडरफुल टू हैव यू and let let's start if you could tell us a little bit about your upbringing um so you're born in india originally right that's correct i was born in kerala uh, in south india okay and what i was curious about is could you tell us a little bit about how you were raised in terms of the spiritual environment and was there a particular deity that the family focused on um yeah i, I was born and brought up as a hindu uh, even though uh, these days uh, i don't associate myself with any religion after uh, coming to bhagwan sri satya sai baba because bhagwan says um, there is only one religion religion of love however i was uh, born and brought up as a hindu um and to answer your question we I, i mean we were foremost the devotees of uh, lord krishna okay uh, but we also worshiped uh, many other forms of god shiva devi forms muruga ayappa ganesha many deities uh, you know we, that's that's been um, a part of our tradition you know absolutely so it's not it's not just one deity you know it's many right. deities so yeah and and on this note i was wondering if you could say a little bit about you know polytheism i know when westerners think of hinduism they kind of they automatically think polytheism but i think this is a little misleading uh because from my understanding of hinduism it it really is monotheistic um so you could say that that this polytheism only is talking about how different people choose to view god it's it's you know many many names for one god is that is that your understanding uh that's a i think that's a popular misconception or mis uh, interpretation uh, in the western world but um at the outset like you know when you look uh, from outside hinduism may feel like it is a polytheistic uh, religion but um i would say from my example uh we never felt like one form is different from the other so in other words like this all these forms coexist and they complement each other and they don't it's in other words they're not competing with each other you know so it's it's a it's a part of an a broader understanding that all these forms uh, names and forms are uh from the same entity right. so that, that's called god uh in our in our family we considered worshiping certain forms have certain benefits for example um lord ganesha before we do uh, something important in life we would pray to lord ganesha since uh, he is the remover of all obstacles so uh, i mean what it means is that the um hindus believe that these gods and goddesses are uh, manifestations of one ultimate god or the parabrahman but at the same time they have um different forms and names that they worship for the principles that they that those forms stand for you know as i said the, the ganesha being um uh, you know the obstacle remover right so right. say yeah say we hindus believe that if you concentrate on a one particular one single aspect of a prayer then that would derive more benefits that's the okay. reason for these different uh, forms uh, that exist you know but the human tendency is to uh, 
misunderstand and misinterpret. So over the years, some people believe that certain forms are more powerful than others, you know? Right, right. So yeah, you, the, ego, the ego gets involved and then, yeah. Exactly. So it's not really polytheistic religion. It's one entity being worshipped as different, different entities. So you, that unity in diversity always exists. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and isn't this why, like, you could, you could go into uh, a, a Hindu family's puja room and they might have Jesus on the altar among other deities. Yeah. So they're, they're, say, they're, think, they're saying that these are, these are different manifestations of God, all equal, and yeah. yeah. Very true. Uh, uh, and if you look uh, in one certain way, from our own lives, for example, uh, in the office, I may be a manager, and when I go, come home, I'm a husband, I'm, and I'm a father. To my parents, I'm a son, and to a friend, I'm a friend. So, but I am the same being all along, you know. But if you want to get something uh, to get done from me at work, you can't come to my home. You have to address the manager in me at work. The same way, the same God is known in different names and forms according to the attributes that we chose to adore in that form. That's the way I like to put it, you know. Right. Then, uh, then, then there's also this uh, Vishwarupa concept. Uh, you, you may know, you may be familiar with the Vishwarupa concept, where which, which encompasses everything that man believes to exist. Okay. Also, that's also there. So it's, it's, uh, it's not just, it's not that simple saying that one form, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a unity in diversity. That, that's what I would like to call it. Okay, okay. Uh, would you say, is, does Vishwarupa imply the same meaning as Parabrahman? No, Vishwarupa is still a form. Vishwarupa is uh, uh, something, because humans cannot understand what, uh, what is Parabrahman, right? Because there is Parabrahman is, uh, has no attributes. So, how the formless can be understood, right? So, the Vishwarubham is also a form, but it's a form that God used to show that everything is Him. So, okay. let's say, for example, if we, we, we imagine, uh, if we cannot imagine what infinity is, right? What is, yeah. so we can imagine only finite. So, Vishwarubha is also something finite that is a manifestation to make man understand that God is everything. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. And it's, uh, it's going to come in later when we talk about Avatar. Okay. You know, this is, this is really powerful principle. I think maybe one of the difficulties Westerners have, I, I feel like our spiritual vocabulary is somewhat limited compared to uh, Hindu spiritual vocabulary. You know, we use God. God is used for so many different things in English, and th there's much more specificity, I think, within the Hindu tradition. Um, but very, that's very true. My my impression. Um, but anyway, so 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 Krishna was the primary uh, uh, focal point for your family, yes. and um, and we might say here, uh, Krishna was a full Purna avatar, correct? Krishna was a Purna, Paripurna avatar, yes. Okay. And, um, and would you say, you know how you were saying earlier that uh, a particular deity is focused on for a particular reason, uh, would you say that applies to Krishna? Are there some things about worshipping Krishna that, um, I mean, in a way, Krishna, Krishna addresses all aspects of life, but uh, are there some special attributes of Krishna which are prominent? Uh, one of the things that uh, attracted me in uh, Lord Krishna that he doesn't evoke any fear in us. So that's the beauty of Lord Krishna that I always, as a child, I adored. I, I don't like God uh, to be someone distant from us who is to be afraid of, of one, you know. So I, I wanted some peaceful, uh, uh, you know, face, a beauty, a, you know, that's what, that's what Krishna symbolizes. And the, the way he, the pranks that he played in his childhood, I, in my childhood, I was able to connect with those stories. So that's what makes uh, the story of Lord Krishna very unique. It gives you that, um, 
uh, you know, with human touch, and then suddenly he reveals his divinity out of nowhere, and then you know makes you realize that you know who he is. So that that's the that's the main thing that I loved about Lord Krishna. I think that's the reason why um, my family also you know was too much uh, very much into Lord Krishna. You know what you're making me think of is that uh, I think both Krishna and Sai Baba they express this. Um, they can express a very, a very uh, patriarchal quality, but also a very matriarchal quality. It's like uh, it, it can be this sweet, kind of comforting, protective quality, yes. or the stern uh, father who is who has to discipline the children. They're, they're capable of both extremes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, the name Swami himself, Sai Baba himself, said that his name implies Sa, Sai Baba means. Uh, Sa means divine, I means mother, God, I mean, Baba means father. So Sai Baba means divine father and mother together in one entity. So he exactly, he expresses that love as a mother and then suddenly, you know, if some, you do something wrong, he chides you as the father does. So exactly, you said it right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, and um, can I ask you, um, is is your family Brahmin? Is it, would you... No, no, we we are not from the Brahmin class. Okay, okay, and and on this note, I wonder if you could. I, I'm always curious about this, and I think I've seen Baba talk about this in a few discourses. You know, the the notion of this caste system is often misunderstood in the West and uh, castigated, uh, perhaps perhaps because of what it evolved into in modern times. But uh, am, am I right in thinking that originally the caste system was perhaps more simply a designation uh, rather than some kind of hierarchical uh, distinction, meaning, meaning that all these classes had an equal role in, the, uh, in, the, in society. Yes, uh, and the caste system, uh, how it evolved, if you look at how it evolved, like in the ancient times, there, was, there wasn't much population. So, um, but in a society, you have to have certain, get certain things done. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why caste system started. So, like, you know, if everybody gets to do what they love to do in the ancient times, there would be nobody to do certain job, right? So, you know, if everybody wants to do the priest job, then who will do the other things? So then when, a, when the population is so less and we don't have many people to choose from, that was a necessity at that time. But, uh, but he, he, over the years, what happened, um, it became, uh, the caste system became like, you know, a part of, um, part of the society and it got so prominent. So that, that's, what, that's what it is. And it's nothing like, uh, you know, these days we don't follow the same, Concept like you know anybody can do anything these days, right? So I mean, you you're not uh, restricted to do certain work just because you're born into a certain caste or anything. Right. But, right. but there was a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding and misconception uh, about this caste system, which had lead to, uh, led to a lot of confusion. That's what it is. And if you look at it, even uh, in Christianity. Like there are, uh, you know, there's baptism, four different baptisms, right? So, uh, if, you, if the baptism also, the same concept yes. in Hindu, four different classes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's another great point, that, that there's very much a, a class system in the West. Uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting. I think uh, one of the interesting aspects of history, you know, with the British occupying India for so long, the British had this, this very uh, stratified class system, and it and it kind of it, it kind of uh, matched what 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 the caste system had become in India in a way in a way it kind of it it, it uh, probably exacerbated the the, the the negative sides of it. But um, but anyway, um, if you look at the last names of uh, people, like you know, they got the last names according to the job they performed. I mean, in right. many cases. Yeah. So it's similar to that, actually. But, you know, but over the years, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people took advantage of the caste system and made it into something else. Yeah. You now, that's the unfortunate thing about it. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, one note, uh, Shujit, uh, just so you know, 
your the camera on your computer is recording you. So if you if you look at the camera, that'll be as if you're looking at the audience. If you look at at my image uh, on the screen, it'll be like you're looking to the side a little bit. So is your camera in the the center top of your your? Yes. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay. 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 So um. All right. So. Okay. So let's move on with your chronology. So, so you're you're growing up in this family in India, and you have a strong devotion to Krishna. And then, at what age? I I, I think I remember your father became interested in Tatcha Sai Baba. And and how old were you when that occurred? Um, that was around 1992, and I uh, I was around uh, 20 years at that time. Okay. okay. Yeah, 1920. You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. And and I I I've seen from the the beautiful interview you did with Ted on Sojourns that uh, at first your mother was a bit reluctant. Yes. <laughs> and uh, maybe maybe you. I'm glad you watched that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was really good. So uh, amazing, amazing story there. The the uh, picture of Sai Baba, the glass cracks, and then yes. your mother takes that as a sign that that maybe she should invite. Yeah. Sai Baba into the house. So, okay. So you're you're 20, and and I think if I remember right, also at that time you were at an age where uh, you weren't really drawn to such a Sai Baba. Um, perhaps you were more immersed in in your studies at the time. I was. Yeah, I was in college at that time, and um, my father uh, used to believe strongly in in Bhagwan, but uh, I was not inclined to even think of uh, him as as God or divine. Because at that time, a lot of uh, controversies were going on, and even in the college, people would talk about it. And then you don't want to get into all these things because you have this uh, peer pressure and things like that. So I, I don't, I didn't want to even um, tell that my family was into uh, Swami's post. Sure, you know, sure. That was, that was kind of. Key. And were you, were you at that age, were you still um, practicing uh, devotional practices associated with Krishna, or were you kind of, had you kind of grown out of that? Yeah, I, I used to do uh, Nama Jabha a lot, but I, I didn't do any meditation or anything. I used to read a lot. I used okay. To, I used to read a lot of spiritual books. Okay. But other than that, uh, I was more busy with studies at that time, I believe. Okay, and what is is Nama Japa? That's the same as Namasmarana. Namasmarana, yeah, but Namasmarana is constant, uh, you know, remembrance of God. But Nama Japa is like you know, you choose a time and then uh, you cho choose like uh, uh, different names of God and then keep repeating them for a particular time. That's Nama Japa. Okay, okay, great. Um, and I guess uh, you know, I thought before we started this interview, uh, we probably. I feel like bhakti is probably your primary path, so we probably will focus mostly on bhakti. Okay. But um, but we can talk about any subject. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm fascinated with Advaita, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. But but in terms of bhakti, maybe you could say for the viewer a little bit about the principle behind bhakti and what's involved. Sometimes a, a, a person can be looking from the outside and not really understand what. What's going on with these devotional practices? Well, I mean, bhakti, uh, in simplest terms, means, de means devotion. Um, devotion involves a lot of love towards the God. That's the thing. And one of the main ways of expressing your devotion is uh, constant remembrance of the divine. So you keep remembering div divinity. You you keep talking about him, or you keep listening to his stories, listening to the uh, songs uh, that sing praises about him. So things like that uh, involves, like, you know, that's that's what the bhakti marga, the, uh, you know, the devotion, devotional path. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, as you rightly assumed that, you know, that's one of the ways that I, uh, you know, I follow Bhagavan in, in the, the path of devotion. Yeah, absolutely. And but you know at the same time it cannot be just devotion because everything else is uh, a part of that uh, you know spiritual progress as well. You have just not just the devotion. You you follow a little bit of karma marga and jnana marga as well to reach your goal. Uh, you know it's a, you know you have to do service 
and at the same time we we have to go through the introspection part with the self you know self inquiry all those things are together but it depends upon what is prominent in you and if if you would ask me yes devotion uh, devotional part yeah i love that that's one of the things i feel is so um so open and inviting about hinduism is that there's these these variety of paths which are suited to different dispositions depending on the individual and but i also love what you're saying because there can be a tendency when you see that there's these alternate paths there can be a tendency to think that you can only take one path but no of course you can you can follow all paths at once you can have varying degrees of interest in whatever path suits you so i like that i like what you're saying yes yes and and uh, uh, if i remember correctly once bhagwan mentioned that you know it's like a uh, like a three stands that you know uh, you know three uh, you know it's a stand with three legs so you know you cannot say one leg is more important than others it's just that you what um in everyone there will be one prominent way that uh, that that person would be following but all the three exist in one form or the other uh and it's very you know, it correlates with each other so yeah i like that and i think too that that they kind of lead to the same end and um and i can think of you know experiences where in bhakti where there are, there are moments of perhaps bliss or a sense of the coming out of the ego for a period uh which can also occur if you're if you're intently doing a self inquiry method related to advaita or even if you're doing seva karma yoga you're out uh you're out caring for someone without thinking of anything in return for yourself and that that action can elicit this quality of an absence of ego i, I think they all kind of invite that yeah that's correct yes i mean it's all eventually how you get rid of the ego right the ego self and then you realize that uh, you are one with the the para brahman the atman and the para brahman so it's all, it's a path that leads you along that way so it's uh, it's all important right 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 definitely okay so so you you went through university and did you were i understand do you uh you're an engineer correct that's correct okay and you did you finish uh, in your early 20 were you 22 when you finished college or um around like um 24 i finished my college okay and then, and, uh, and and at what age did you start to become a little more interested in sachi sai baba i uh, around like that period uh because i at first i had my first uh, darshan of bhagwan in 1992 and during that darshan actually my parents uh, were going so i i had no choice i had to go because my father said you have to come with me i resisted a little bit that you know you know in in our tradition we don't we respect the i mean as as in any other tradition we respect about that so you were you were just saying that um out of respect for your parents you you agreed to go i agreed to go yes and um the moment uh, that you know the first first darshan itself uh, you know i fell for so me because uh, the the way he was walking at us you know i had a intense feeling in my heart that uh, he is divine yeah. i i cannot even understand or try to understand what that uh, feeling was but the moment i looked at him i knew that he was divine something happened in my heart and then also I, i was able to touch his lotus feet at that time and uh, kind of a vibration like an electric uh, shock you know it, it uh, went through my spine and that was like the icing on the cake i would say that's incredibly powerful yeah. um and and maybe i i like how you're it's it's hard to explain these things and i i i feel that atheists sometimes are are uh they have a they have a hard time understanding how this emotion and and devotion can arise for another human being or another apparent human being um and maybe it maybe it is just something that can't be defined but uh but i guess 
I guess you just stated it beautifully there. I mean, I mean, how would you how would you describe to an atheist what's happening in an experience like the one you just described? Um, the difference between um, atheist and the non-atheist is that whether you're following your mind or you're following your heart, right? Which is prominent in you? I tend to follow my heart. That's why I believe now in Bhagavan. You cannot understand certain things with your mind. It's, it's a part of your being that is already inscribed in you. It's, it's a part of your, uh, what do you call, the, uh, the samskaras that you bring with you into this body which unknowingly has made all kind of impressions in you with, with, from the past life experiences. And right. that, those experiences, the, the, total, uh, the totality of those experiences uh, is what we are in this life. So looking from that perspective, it's very difficult to make an atheist understand un until and unless he or she himself gets that experience at some point of time. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I think it's really a matter of experience. And and you could say that if an atheist has not had this kind of experience, then they're not really in a position to make a judgment about it. So, um it's inter it's, in it's kind of like it's kind of like speaking a language. If you don't know the vocabulary, you can't speak it. There is uh there is one little story that uh, influenced me when I came to Bhagwan, uh, you know. And if you want, I can narrate that. Yes, please. It's, it, it involves an atheist, actually. Um, so, like, after I came back from uh, Puttaparthi, I was a changed man. I, I was totally into Bhagavan. I was reading all kind of books. I knew that uh, Swami was divine. He was God walking on this earth. But still that, um, uh, that reality that he is everything, you know, he is uh, the, the totality. That never, uh, you know, that reality never struck in me until and unless that I came into touch with this person and heard his story. He's from the same town as me from back in, in Kerala in India. Uh -huh. And he uh, was an atheist. So he uh, never believed in, uh, in God. And he was, um, in fact, you know, you know, he was against God and he was running a propaganda against uh, idol worship and superstitions. He was a youth leader, a very, very popular youth leader. Um, and he used to go to the temples and stand outside uh, the temple with a microphone and he used to give lengthy speeches against the temple culture and idol worship. And uh, so many people uh, used to gather around him. And one of his, one of his main targets were Bhagavan Sri Sathya Sai Baba. Mm -hmm. And he used to make Vibhuti appear in his hands uh, just like Bhagwan would do because he, he has some magic tricks that he does. And he was so powerfully, uh, you know, talking against uh, uh, Bhagwan. And then um, he was in the college at that time. He was uh, uh, in a senior college at that time. And he and his friends, he, they, they, have, they used to sit in a one particular place very close to their college. And there was a temple of Kali. Kali, you know, the goddess Kali? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there was a temple uh, with a Kali idol in the, in, in, his, uh, in, in the premises, but it was an open-air idol. It was no, uh, there was no roof on, on it. Okay. So one time what happened when, he, when they were going uh, towards that place uh, to have their usual uh, discussions, um, this person, he found a piece of innerwear uh, lying on the side of the road. So what he did was he just took a, uh, what do you call, like a stick, and then he, uh, you know, with the stick, he just, uh, you know, lifted this piece of innerwear and then just threw it against the idol inside the compound. Uh -huh. So what happened? The, the piece of this inner wear is a very dirty piece. It just landed directly on this idol. So he had a good laugh about it, he and his friends, and then he went about doing the routine discussions. 
so that was that was one uh, event and then later on two years later um one of his friends very close friends of him he was a big sai devotee and they uh, you know what what he does is he arranges uh, you know bus to a bus to go to puttaparthi every year and he takes mm-hmm. many devotees from our place uh, to puttaparthi to see bhagwan so he uh, being a well wisher asked this other brother uh, would you like to come to puttaparthi and uh, this brother at that time he didn't have any job and he was uh, having some health issues uh, so uh, after much persuasion he said okay i will come with you this is a good uh, opportunity for me to examine satya sai baba up close so he also got into the bus and he went to puttaparthi and fortunately they got an interview so once they were inside the interview uh, swami began speaking to the devotees and uh, you know once in a while he would turn around and create vibhuti so this person would say oh i know exactly how that is done don't try to fool me you know and then again um, he goes around and comes to this person and swami comes and then smiles beautifully then swami lifts his leaves to expose his hands and you know he does this wavy motion and then again this person says oh you still cannot convince me with these tricks you know so so what happens now is like uh, so uh, swami comes and as i said he lifts his leaves and creates a vibhuti um and you know nanu doesn't still believe immediately swami holds him with one hand hugs him are you there uh, paul yeah, yeah yeah i cannot see you on the camera is it okay oh yeah you yeah you're fine you're fine yeah so uh, swami comes and uh, hugs him with one hand and with one hand he just lifts uh, something up and ask um, uh, this person can you uh, do you know what this is so he looks up and immediately he sees this old decaying dirty piece of innerware <laughs> okay it was hanging from swami's uh, fingertips then he asked do you remember what this is uh, if not i will remind you two years ago you put this right on my head wow right So you just you just hit the the climax of this great story. So <laughs> yes. so let's let's clarify for the viewer. Yes. Baba actually materialized a piece of fabric that had been thrown on an idol 2 years previously. Yes. And showed it to this man. Yes. And and what was the man's response when this occurred? Um actually just just uh, let me rewind a little bit. Okay. 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 Because I wanted to get the continuity of the story. Okay. Swami uh, held held him in with one hand, and then Swami lifted up this piece of cloth. And this person, his name is Nanu. He told me that there was a yellow color piece of cloth, right? And it was decayed, torn out, and it was like almost, you know, uh, disintegrating. Yeah. the exactly the way he threw it on on the idol of kali and it was hanging from his hand and he didn't know what to to think what he he couldn't even speak out all he was doing he was sobbing and he just fell on baba's uh, feet and you know he kept on crying and then swami lifted him up and you know started giving him some advice and you know he says he have so much energy you have to turn this energy towards god so he came back as a, a changed man and we all saw the whole town saw a, a new uh, person from that day on so the same person who used to talk all kind of rubbish against god now he has become a devout temple goer you know <laughs> so this the, the same places where he used to talk against baba he used to go there and talk uh, you know about baba <laughs> and his uh, you know his leelas and miracles so people were confused you know people were uh, started uh, saying that you know oh, okay 
uh, he went to Baba and you know he got bribed by Sai Baba's people. <laughs> you know? So, so that's uh, some people believe. Some people followed uh, Baba because. So that's why I said an atheist, you know, is only an atheist until that person gets an experience. Yeah. Right. We were all atheists at one point of time in some life. Yeah. Right. Until we got an experience, you know, that experience. And as the soul follows its journey, some of the impressions we carry forward from our previous birth stays with us. And that's the reason why some people are more inclined towards spirituality and some people are not from birth, you know. Yes, this is a, it's a beautiful story and it highlights a lot of different things. Um, it highlights the omnipresence of Baba, and I, I think it might be worth sharing with the viewer here that um, this is not uncommon among Psy devotees that Baba will in some way or another show that he is the same as any other deity. That's true. And this is again the, the concept of the polytheism that we were talking about earlier. Yes. Even though they were, they appear to be different. Uh, Bhagwan shows that uh, you know he is everything, and it was a, such a, it made a, such a profound impact in me because that was the beginning uh, of my journey with Bhagwan, and it gave me an idea or a glimpse of what he really was. You know, just uh, imagine for a second, like one small temple with an open air deity, you know, and uh, he he claims that. That was uh, him, you know. So right, and this is uh, this this location. This is in Kerala somewhere. This is in Kerala, yeah. In and, Cal and let's tell Cal the viewer how far is this place in Kerala from Puttaparthi, where Sai Baba resides most did reside most of the time, right? Or or well, we could say Baba is still residing there, but uh, you know, yeah. in, in in the physical form up until 2011. Yeah, this is uh, uh, like a 12 hours train journey. 12 hours train trip. So, so what this reveals, Sacha Sai Baba was able to materialize out of nothing this cloth that was sitting out and getting weathered for two years, and he was able to do it in a way that had a, a powerful transformative effect on this man's spiritual awareness. Yes, absolutely. So that's, uh, that's uh, I mean, in, in his case, it was a little different because um, Baba also told him that he was with Bhagwan in one of his previous li uh, lives. So um, the atheism was not part of his samskara or the previous uh, impression. It's just that it was blocked by his own mind and the moment that happened, it just bursted out and came out. You know, that's a, that's so it's not a natural progression. So it's not, a, a, you know, in one moment he was transformed and he went to the other end being a devote, uh, you know. Well, that's a, that's a huge point, Sriji, that, that, that you're making because uh, Baba doesn't perform this miracle with everyone. Uh, that, you know, everyone who was privileged to get an interview, and, and everyone who did not get an interview uh, has a different experience with Satya Sai Baba, but it, I guess it's it, you could say it's related to their karma and, and what they're ready for, and um, sometimes Sai Baba talks about doing things at the right moment. Uh, hmm. uh, it has to be the right moment, and, and he knows what that is, but uh, you're, you're reminding me of... of devotees who have a strong uh, devotion to a particular deity and they've come to become aware of, of Baba and they have some uh, it's they have some difficulty in turning their devotion to Baba because they've had this devotion to the old deity and then they'll have a dream where their cherished deity turns into such as by Baba uh, exactly. or there'll be there'll be some other uh, event in their life that indicates Baba's the same and so exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's that oneness uh, that Swami expresses in different ways to make us understand that He is the very uh, same entity whom we have been uh, worshipping all, all along. 
beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now you you covered a lot of this in your other interview, so I don't I I'll try not to go over everything, but if you could briefly tell us about your how how your devotion to Satya Sai Baba increased, and then when uh, Satya Sai Baba did uh, let's say temporarily leave the physical form in 2011, uh, you had some questions about why that happened, when it happened, and the discussions that were occurring within the Psy community weren't really satisfying uh, your questions about that. Is that accurate? Um, partly yes, uh, partly no, because um, first thing is that in my heart I knew that Sami's uh, avatar was not done yet. So I just followed my heart. Uh, that's always uh, the, 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 uh, the easiest trick that you can do in always follow your heart, right? <laughs> so no matter what people say about Bhagavan, people say if we follow our heart, the things are very clear, right? You know, we, we never forget who he is. He can play any kind of Maya tricks on you, but if we follow our heart, we know that he is playing the Maya. And I keep telling Swami all the time, you know, you can fool others, but not me, you know. <laughs> That's good. That's a great position to take. Sriji. Yeah. I mean, he, he can say anything, you know, his Maya is very powerful, by the way. So that's one of the things that uh, God uses Maya as a tool uh, for testing his devotees. And also he, uh, everything that even his uh, body and his existence, uh, Swami once said, is through the illusionary, the uh, illusory energy, which is the Maya. So he uses Maya to even uh, project his form into this world. So, uh, and he uses Maya as a tool, uh, you know, to keep the people ne uh, whom he wants near him and to keep away the people that, whom he doesn't, uh, you know, want to be near him yet. You know, I would use that word yet because yes. eventually everyone has to, has to, you know, reach that, uh, uh, reach at his lot of speed. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, uh, so in my heart, uh, you know, I heard this, that, uh, you know, Swami is truth, you know, and his words will never fail. And if he has said something, that will come to pass. And that is the beginning of everything, and that eventually led to the writing of uh, Sai Daiging Dinkam. So without um, that, that kind of uh, feeling in the heart, nobody can believe in uh, Bhagavan's return. It's impossible because it's unthinkable. Um, to many, even close devotees uh, I've talked to, they, it's unthinkable for them uh, to, to imagine that uh, a miracle of that magnitude can happen. Or Swami would. It's not that they don't. They don't it's not that they're saying that Swami cannot do it, but um, they say Swami wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, yeah. um, but in my heart, I, I knew that Swami was going to do it. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, I love the simplicity of your position, which is Baba said it. Baba said it, and therefore, that's true. Yeah. Exactly. So, and many people tell me that, you know, we have to just leave it to Bhagavan's will. Uh, whatever he does is his will, so let's not uh, question him. So, but I tell them that I'm not questioning him. I'm just accepting what is coming in my heart. Uh, to be true, because I know from my past experience, whatever I felt in my heart has been true. If that was not the case, I wouldn't be with Bhagavan right now. Because I am here because I followed my heart. So, yeah. And if you if you look at Swami's, one time Swami said, um, my word will never fail. And he followed up immediately with another statement that it must happen as I will. So to me, it's very clear that Swami's will is expressed in his words. So he wills it and then he says it. That we don't know what is going to happen regarding the things that he, he has not spoken about. We don't know what his will is regarding those things. But whatever, whatever he has spoken about, that was his will. And his will is indomitable and it will it's, never fail. Uh, whenever he wills it, it instantly uh, it's, uh, it happens. It is written in the cosmos that it will happen. 
So yes, it's, that that's how powerful his will is. Well, and I think too, uh, you're writing this book is an expression of his will, I would say. So, you know, it's like your your interest in this whole issue and your desire to write the book and then some of the phenomena that have occurred while you wrote the book and after the book, I think, indicate pretty clearly that it was Baba's will that you write it. So, uh, so yeah. anyone who's saying you should rest in Baba's will, well, Baba's will is manifesting through you and your inclination to do these things. Exactly, exactly. I, and I completely believe that it was uh, uh, Baba's work, uh, you know, because I, I never wrote anything before, and I'm, I'm not a person who who is well-versed in, uh, uh, you know, writing, uh, and I'm not uh, well-versed in, uh, you know, any kind of, um, like, what do you call, uh, you know, spiritual matters, writing about spiritual matters or anything like that. So uh, the way it came about itself is uh, in itself is a miracle. I would say that I wrote it. I mean, it you know it was inspired and it came out through me. Well, that you know, it's it's funny you say that, Sujit, uh, because I think one of the nice things about your book is uh, it's very direct. It's very direct, and it just it just lays out the facts. So and and maybe we should say I should have had you state this earlier. You know. There, there's a, there's more than one reference, but I think perhaps the most well-known reference is that in a discourse, I guess it was in the 60s, Baba said he will be here until he's 96. Is that correct? Yes. In one of his discourses, he said he'll, he'll be in his uh, body until 96 years old. Okay. And so uh, if you take his word as the truth, that means he would he would be here until... Well, let, let's say in 2011, how old was he in solar years? He was, um, uh, I think, 84 years and a few months. Okay. Um, into his 85th year. But in, in, uh, in Bhagwan's case, we, all, we always uh, we celebrated 85th birthday in 2010, November. So he was 85 years old in that, right. if you look at that, that point, you know. Okay. Yeah. So and it's been um, appro approximately three years since. No, or the way that three-year belief came into existence. Uh, let me give a little background. Um, see, when I was going through Bhagwan's uh, discourses, like when after I come came into Bhagwan, I used to read a lot. And whenever I saw some some things like that, I used to collect Swami's discourses and you know Swami's words which I found very interesting, you know, so I can go back and refer to it. And one of the things that I found was how Swami speaks about uh, how long he will be in this, uh, in this earth, in this avatar. And I noticed that sometimes Swami would say 96 and then sometimes Swami would contradict that and say some other uh, number. So I kept seeing uh, you know this and said I, I used to ask him in my mind that Swami, you know, can you please stick to one number here? You know, yes, that's the thing. yes. So uh, you know, I used to joke with him in my mind, which was, but I knew that there is some catch here, but I couldn't figure it out. You know, until he left his body, and then right, I, right, right, and I, and I went back and read those statements. I'll just take one example. Um, I think it was in. Uh, 1959, uh, Swami made a statement, I will be in this model human form for 59 years more. Okay? The, so that's one statement. And another uh, time Swami said, I will live under, until the age of 96. Now how these two relate together? Can you, you know, we cannot even imagine because if you look from 1959, uh, you you add uh, you know, uh, you know 1960 from 1960 1960 Swami made the statement, and if you add 59 years more, it would take us until 2019. Right. 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 Let's. But if you take 96 years old, Swami was born in 1926, so it should take us to 2022 sometime. Uh huh. I mean 2022. So where did this three years go? Right. So, the, so that's the, that's the catch here. But in 1960, when Swami made a statement, what he said was, "I will be in my body for 59 years more." 
right? And the other statement is, I will live until the age of 96. So I kept thinking how someone live until the age of 96, yet live in his body only for 93 or 94 years, right? So that's the way I saw it. Okay, so that means, you know, he has to be out of his body for a certain number of years. That's the only way both statements can come true. Because Swami's Swami is true. Both statements have to come true, right? Well, so and already played this game long time ago. It's not that we we come to realize it only now. So many people say Swami was so uh, old and his body was weak, so he has to leave his body. And that's a Maya. He, even if he tells me that he was old, he was uh, too tired, or I would sell the same thing to me to him, and I will tell him, Swami, you can fool others, not me. You know. Because I love it. I love it. I love it, Sujit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's a great point. It's a great point. It's so easy. I mean, he even he even warns devotees in the discourses. He says, don't think this is real. Don't think this body is, is what I am, you know. So it's a great point that you're saying. Right, exactly. um, and and it's, almost, it's almost like, I mean, you know, I, at times I've been kind of like what you were saying. It's like, come on, Baba, just, just tell us directly, you know. And I mean, he has his reason for not doing that. But it, but looking back on your characterization of this, it's almost as though Baba left a little hint in there for someone who's diligent enough to find it. It's a little, it's a, it's a hint to explain what's happening, you know. Um, and uh, and and a, and a devotee wrote to me a few months, uh, I think probably a year ago, and she had a dream uh, after reading Sai Tai Kingdom from. She had a dream, that, and in the dream she was asking Swami uh, all these things that she read in Sai the Kingdom Come, and she asked Bhagwan, is that true, uh, whatever is written? And Swami uh, uh, chidingly told her something like, man, I can't believe that you guys figured it, figured it out. Something like that. Jokingly, <laughs> Swami figured in the dream, you know. So, directly <laughs> was confirming that this, there is something to all this, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and you could see, uh, I mean, one one guess I have is that by doing it this way without without um, telling us in advance what was going to happen, it's really been, um, you know, a challenging experience for a lot of devotees, a, a spiritually challenging experience. Um, yes. But... Um, Still, I, I wish he had told us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the beauty of all, all of this, right? So if, if everything is revealed, then how I mean, we cannot enjoy the play that much. Yeah. You know, but if, if you look at even a, a, a skit or a play that's going on, right, there, there will be some twists and turns. Without that, that play will be nothing. It will not be enjoyable. So if everything is revealed, and even now I don't believe that everything will happen exactly the way that was said in that book. There is all with Swami. There is always this element of surprise and mystery. And but what I'm certain of is that we will get more than what we expect. That's always been the case, Swami. You know, because he is there's something going on that we don't understand, we don't realize. We try to uh, what is. You know, we, you know, we try to put it uh, and give it a definite picture, but it's never, never that case with Bhagwan. So eventually, when we uh, understand everything, we would uh, be even more surprised. That's what I believe. But we'll be pleasantly surprised. Now, you're making me want to ask you about an event that occurred back in May of uh, this year, where where I, I forget the name of the town, but one of Baba's schools has been built there. And there's, there's some indication that Baba's presence is very strongly felt there. And there was an event where Baba appeared and, and spoke through one of the students. And there were some discourses that were recorded. What's your assessment of that, uh, that phenomena? I too heard about it and I, I wrote briefly about it also. Uh, the place was Kodaikanal, you, you, you mentioned, right? It's, it's a oh, was it? okay. station, station of Kodaikanal, uh, and and the students and the, the staff from uh, the Mudana Harli Swami's institution yes. had gone there, and uh, Swami had uh, given the discourse, uh, you know, with the, you know, uh, with the help of uh, another student. That's the same story that you're talking about, or y yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. 
Uh, actually, um, the thing is that I I did not explore it that much uh, to say for a definite what it is, you know. And uh, I never been to that uh, place. I, might, I was there before. Actually, I went to Mudanahalli uh, before this uh, even happened. But I've never been after uh, this even happened. And I have not um, spoken to anybody. And uh, I spoke to people briefly about it to get an idea of what was going on. But I did not deeply explore uh, that. Okay. But, but at the same time, I believe that uh, Bhagwan can do anything. So, yeah. uh, you know, he can he can come and he can do anything. And those are blessings for uh, the individual devotees. How he confers it is entirely up to him. Yeah. yeah. What I say. So, um, I uh, did. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, um, in my view, in my understanding, and this is what in my heart I feel that the reappearance is a much more bigger event. Um, it would be... Uh, event that will uh, be, you know, it will be, there will be some kind of event that will trigger it. And within no time, the the explosion of the energy from that event would take over the entire world, which would lead to the golden age. That's what I believe. Okay, I'm really glad you said that. Uh, and I, I, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about this in terms of, you know, one of the things... Uh, I, I remember Baba saying in discourses was talking about this golden age, and and what exactly does this golden age mean? And um, you know, if you look around the world today, there's it's quite uh, there's there's a lot of challenging, uh, questionable things happening. Um, you could say, you know, the Hindus call it Kali Yuga, and there's there's much evidence to to show that this is definitely Kali Yuga. <laughs> And uh, and that we have not yet entered the golden age. So um, although I know there's one discourse where Baba says, you know, it's, it's kind of already begun. And I guess in a sense you could say we're moving that way. I remember, you know, the the fall, the ta tearing down of the of the Berlin Wall. You know, that was made a, a step in the positive direction. But um, but I think the golden age is going to be so much more than that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about why you think. This kind of event will will be necessitated to achieve that kind of turning the whole the global society in a different direction. Yes. Um, see, in, in, when in, when we carefully analyze Bhagawan's statements on golden age, it is very clear that it is um, not a, like a one-off event where only some people get benefited from it. Golden age is something that affects everyone in this world. And it will, it is not only like the people change spiritually and people, the individual, uh, ch the change in the people, it will be the change in the environment, the circumstances, it will be change in the, the vibratory, um, you know, the energy that, uh, that prevails in this uh, cosmos. It, it is a combination of everything that would bring about this event. If you, if you carefully analyze Bhagavan's statement, once Swami said that the beauty of uh, the golden age, you cannot even imagine how it is going to be. It's, it will be such a beautiful time. So, uh, you know, if we go progressively, like, you know, people changing, Bhagavan's, uh, you know, Bhagavan's teachings are there, we... Uh, you know, many people uh, coming into Bhagawan and, you know, they're slowly making this change. It would take thousands of years for uh, such a golden age to come, you know, if you go progressively from here on. So it's not, in my, in my uh, understanding and in my belief, it is going to be a sudden change. And Bhagawan himself told in an interview to one of the people that change will come instantly. And Bhagavan also mentioned to his love that even the old people who are living now will live to see that age. Yes. Which will come in our lifetimes. It has to. So all these things uh, give me the impression that it's not just uh, some, you know, spiritual um, change that's going to happen. It's going to be a much more bigger than that, that we cannot imagine at this point. 
it could be an event that would bring about this change. For example, if you say, um, let's say, like, you know, when we go to a temple, right, or a church, we feel, uh, you know, so much of peace, right? And even a, a criminal, if you go to such an environment, he would, he or she would feel that kind of peace and, you know, that evil tendencies will go away, at least uh, for a temporarily it will go away. Yeah. Because of the vibrations in that place. Now, imagine if such vibrations are there, uh, you know, in, that, per, uh, that pervades the entire cosmos. So people have, uh, you know, such an environment, if people have such an environment, it will be much easier for them to turn to God and, you know, live in a spirit. Such kind of environmental changes are also coming in my belief. You know, I, I love that you're saying that because one of the questions I want to ask you is, you know, for devotees who know the rules that Baba lays out for devotees to follow, some of us aren't always good at following those rules. So uh, what what uh, advice can you give to people? Of course, you know, we all, we all want to be the best we can. Um, and some of us sometimes don't measure up. What would you say to that? Uh, because I think Satya Sai Baba sets a very high standard. Um, what would you say about that? Well, um, we all try our best, that's for sure, right? I mean, it's not like uh, we are not trying. But the, if we have the firm faith that he is um, our guru and he is guiding us, then uh, there is a... The way we, we, we should do it is we should always try to put the honors on our Guru. The, way, the, the reason why I say it is that the prayers are everything. The prayers is a, we, we don't communicate with Him uh, directly, right? So prayer is one, the only means of our communication with, um, uh, with Bhagawan. I mean, if He's not going to give us interview, then we have to follow it through our prayers. So if we pray to, him to take control um, over, of us, and then, you know, if, to act through us, and, you know, he, if we give him an open-ended contract, Swami, you know, I dedicate everything at your Lord's feet, you know, please change me, right? Then he will bring about the circumstances in our life in such a way that the change will be easier for us. And this is, this I'm speaking from my own experience. You know, we, we believe that um, he has uh, uh, the full control over us. And, you know, he can, uh, if we, because one time Bhagavan said he won't, uh, he can break you open and enter your uh, life and fix you up. But he wouldn't do that. But if we pray hard and if we give him, uh, but you know, a blank contract, signed contract saying, well, when you write whatever you want in it, you know, I'm giving my life to you. Then he would act upon it and he would fix you. And Swami once made a promise to everyone that, you know, if you say yes to me, at, from that moment onwards, you are mine and I will not stop until I fix you. Beautiful. If we have that firm uh, belief, definitely is going to fix you. So, so many things it happened. Uh, he has stopped me from doing something wrong and making a situation where I am not able to do it. Uh -huh. so, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But then later on, I feel like it was him who stopped me from doing it because it would have been very wrong to do that. Yeah, yeah. So that's the way he acts upon us. So I think, you know, if we try hard, it will definitely happen. But along with that, uh, whatever we do, we have to have these prayers all the time. Uh, one thing I, I'd, I'd like to have you define a little bit for us, and if you have to go, let me know, Srijit. I know we're probably running out of time. But um, I wanted to kind of define a little bit more the concept of avatar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we said earlier, I think Krishna and Satya Sai Baba are the only uh, full Purna avatar. That means 16 points. So in uh, uh, Hindu uh, Vedic texts, Mm -hmm. there, there are outlines of exactly what an avatar is, and, and maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Um, avatar uh, simply 
It means that um, God is being born in on earth, uh, uh, you know, with in a human form. That's all the avatar means. It's, it means descent. Avatar means descent. So one time, uh, Bhagwan said that, um, you know, it's just there's the, the pure parabrahman or the uh, the atma state comes into the level of the body. That's that's what avatar is. And it also means that, um, like, you know, in order to help, uh, to contact and help the, the humankind, uh, you know, God takes birth from age to age. So what, what was your other question regarding the avatar? I forgot the question. Well, uh, I just wanted to clarify, perhaps for atheists or, or people who have other faiths, Mm -hmm. outside of the Hindu tradition, and they're not familiar with the concept. You know, in Christianity, uh, there's a term in the Old Testament, uh, Emmanuel, mm -hmm. uh, which they use for Jesus, and that, that means God with us in human form. And, and sometimes uh, someone looking from outside can't, can't get their head around how can someone believe that God can be contained in a, in a single human form. Uh, any more than any other human being. And, and I guess one thing I'm thinking about that is, well, God can create the whole universe, so God can also come in as a single form within it, and, and yet God also is animating all of those apparently separate forms in the first place, right? Yeah, and, and uh, Swami gave uh, two very good examples why avatars, uh, you know, you know descend uh, into the earth. And one example he gave is like, suppose uh, someone um, is, you know, uh, sinking in, in, in ocean, right? You know, he's not able to swim and sink in ocean. Somebody to, uh, you know, if whoever is watching it has to dive into the waters to save that person. So similarly, God also descends down to help the, the mankind uh, who, which needs help, right? And it's Bhagavan also said, um, a mother, let's say a child is, is playing, and if the, chi the child um, falls down, uh, so the mother immediately goes and, you know, you know uh, goes down to grab the child, takes her in, in arms and protects the child. This, the, the avatar is also same way, out of pure love towards mankind, he descends on this earth in the human form. That's what that's what avatar is. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And and I think you know tying in with that, I would say uh, you know without the avatar, we have a lot of forces moving in a direction that could easily uh, destroy the planet. Abs uh, absolutely. So uh, it, it was it was it was required to uh, avert catastrophe. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And. Uh, the way the humanity is uh, moving, it is moving in towards uh, self-destruction, and uh, only God can save us from this. Yeah. And God, God can do everything from there, up there, you know. But he that does that goes against the laws of karma. You know, you have to, uh, we have to change ourselves, and God has to give an opportunity to change by by coming down and showing us what needs to be done. Well, it's it's interesting that you say that, and I was gonna gonna invite you to go into you know discerning my will and God's will, and uh, you know in the sense uh, you know Satya Sai Baba Krishna God can be referred to as the puppeteer, right? The the puppeteer yeah. who's who's the 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 primary force behind all phenomena, um, but uh, at the same time. There, there's a there's a, a process of uniting your apparent individual will with the divine will. I don't know yes. what you might say about that, but because it's because it is the play. I you know I, there's a phrase that keeps coming to me. Um, Baba said, uh, "I separated myself from myself so that I could love myself." And and as you've been indicating, you know it's it's a magnificent play with so much diversity, and it has the the evil players and the good players, and it makes it this rich drama. And yet, 
this whole big drama is reaching a point that's going to involve a transformation initiated by the Avatar. So yeah. that's part of the drama too. Um, I don't know, what would you say to all that? Well, um, so you, you started uh, about asking about the divine will, right? How do you recognize the divine will? Um, you, you, were you uh, asking about like our own lives, like, you know, how we know or what to do and not to do? Right. I mean, you could say, you could say that if someone does an egoistic action, ultimately God is the primary motivating force because, because God motivates all action. But you could say from a spiritual perspective, uh, you know, right action or dharmic action is egoless. Uh, but, and yet, and yet you are an individual who operates in the world and makes decisions. You know, how do you navigate that? See, the, the thing is, um, the trick is to identify uh, the actions that originate out of our lower ego or, you know, and because ego is always going to be there, I mean, you know, uh, up to an extent, because if the, the purpose of life is to go beyond that. So if we are beyond that, then we are divine ourselves, right? So, I mean, uh, most of us are not there yet. But in this avatar time, uh, Bhagavan once said that, you know, uh, because because Swami is there on this earth, right? Uh, he gives what is what he calls the grace marks. So when we write a, a test, you know, sometimes we we don't have the enough marks to pass, to pass. But because of some other things that we did, uh, you know, we get something called these grace marks. So that's what the Bhagwan does. So he doesn't expect us all to be God realized people who you know has taken, uh, go, you know, gone beyond our ego and things like that. But he also gives us, uh, in this Kali Yuga, uh, Namasmarana is the best way to, to realize God and to attain liberation. So, uh, you know, going from that perspective, constant uh, Namasmarana is the easiest way, easiest way to uh, realize that. And as we do that, you know, we, we, find ourselves, you know, we are cleansing ourselves from all our bad traits. So, um, the ego that uh, you were talking about, we will immediately know when a thought arises out of our ego or not, and then we will be able to immediately suppress it, uh, so to speak. So, our intellect comes into play, or the intellect or the higher ego self, you know, comes into to play. So, which allows us to discriminate and say, okay, what what is good and what is bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and the divine will, as you said, um, many times there are uh, there are there are times where when we think uh, that okay, Bhagwan wants us to do it in a certain way, and sometimes it's our imagination that because we want to do certain things, we always say, okay, Bhagwan probably wants me to do it this way. But if we really follow our heart and we know that whether that inspiration is coming from Bhagavan or not, that's the only way to do it. It's, it. It cannot be explained as it comes only by practice. I'm not saying that I'm there yet, but you know there is a there are certain times when we really feel we are connected to Him, and at that time, whatever comes in is His message. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Sujit. There's one last thing I'd like to, to say, and, and you can comment on it, um, kind of going back to the, the power of the presence of the Avatar in this transformation into the Golden Age. And it seems that one of the things that will have to happen is a rejoining or a coming together of these different religions, which have for so long kind of fought each other. And so... the. To me, such a Sai Baba is the perfect one to do that in the sense that we talked about earlier whereby God has many names and forms. And, you know, Baba, such a Sai Baba speaks to Muslims and Christians and Hindus and Buddhists and followers of every faith. And so this, this Golden Age transformation will have uh, as a part of it 
a reconciliation between these different religions, I think. Yes, absolutely. And uh, that's what Swami always says, right? Uh, there's only one religion, religion of love. And if you, if you look at it, um, Swami is not here to form another religion. In fact, Swami um, once said he is every divine principle um, that ever existed. So that's that's what Bhagavan is. And he uh, answers to uh, the calls to gods in all religions, uh, irrespective of uh, whom they call it. All names and forms are his. That's what Bhagavan said. So, of course, you know, definitely I believe that uh, it's going to be Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba who unites all religions. If you see in all religions, there are prophecies that uh, exactly match the description and the characteristics of Sri Satya Sai Baba, uh, which I have mentioned in uh, Sai Thai Kingdom Come as well briefly. So it all uh, points to that uh, period when everything comes together and culminates into this uh, uh, united world where every everyone... Uh, praise uh, to the one single entity that that is you know God you know and and forgetting all the differences that exist. Beautiful, beautiful. And I will I'm going to put a note in the bottom of the video, mm -hmm. Sujit, that uh, refers viewers who don't know about your book and your website to those. And you know one of the beautiful things you've done is you've written this and you just have given it away and people can go to the site and read it online. You can order the book. Uh, it's just really beautiful, really beautiful. So, Thank you. So thanks for taking the time. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy that uh, you know, we could do this. You know, we, we were going back and forth in the emails, but finally, uh, you know. Well, I, I know how busy you are, and so I'm, I'm really grateful that you were able to do it. And, and thanks to Satya Sai Baba for allowing it to happen. Yes, you know, I uh, you know offer my salutations and gratitude at the Divine Lotus Feet of our dear Lord. Thank you, Paul. Sai Ram, Shijit. Sai Ram, Sai Ram. Take care. All right, bye-bye.
Sadanandar 